we should think about think about loneliness not in terms of like what you might like in an ideal world, but rather what you need. I think someone who's chronically and deeply lonely is lacking something that they quite literally need in the same way that if you're dehydrated, you know, you're lacking, you're lacking water for your body. What is your definition of loneliness? Yeah, I mean, so you would think that that would be a relatively easy question to answer because we're talking a ton about loneliness these days. There's reams of research about loneliness. Um, I was just looking at a kind of graphic someone put together of it, it must have been a hundred different companies that are have been stood up recently to try to combat loneliness. Um, the funny thing is, though, that loneliness is really quite hard to define. The, uh, the, the regnant definition that gets used in pretty much all social science is uh, that loneliness is a discrepancy between the social life that you have and the one that you would like to have. Um, and it's, you know, it's construed, you know, so, so broadly like that, because um, there's just like a weird breadth of situations in which one can be lonely. Um, so, you know, I think we all have some experience of being in a house full of people who, who love you to death um, or hopefully, hopefully we do. Um, but, but feeling terribly lonely while mm -hmm. you're there, um, or of walking alone in the woods, um, and feeling not lonely at all. Um, and so, so given that breadth, you know, the, the, uh, tendency has been just to sort of use this like discrepancy model where it's like, well, you don't have what you want. That's all we can say, right? You wish it was different than it is. Um, which I think, you know, it's correct as far as it goes, but it's it's not terribly meaty, um, you know. And if uh, you know if Dan is terribly lonely for a particular season of his life, and we say, well, the problem you got there, Dan, is you got a discrepancy. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it, it just isn't terribly illuminating. And and also, I think like given what we know about what loneliness does to us, right? That it it you know makes us die earlier, you know prevents our cells from repairing as, as they otherwise would. Like it, it just makes us sicker and, and unhappier in lots of ways. To me, it seems like just throwing it on like, well, he doesn't have as much as he wants seems a little, a little facile. And, and that actually we should think about, um, think about loneliness, not in terms of like what you might like in an ideal world, but rather what you need. Um, I think someone who's chronically and deeply lonely is lacking something that they quite literally need in the same way that if you're dehydrated, you know, you're lacking, you're lacking water for your body. Hmm. And I think now that, now that, <laughs> now that I stopped there, I think I haven't given you a definition yet at all. Um, so the one that my friends and I, or my, my colleagues and I have, uh, have been working on lately is that, uh, you know, the opposite of loneliness is shared agency. Um, and so loneliness is a lack of shared agency. Um, and, you know, by, by agency, um, you know, I don't mean just any sort of action. Um, I mean, something a little more specific. Um, so if full human agency is a, a really quite amazing and, and complex thing. You know, humans, I think, alone among the animals, have the ability to you know, engage in all sorts of day-to-day, -day, moment to moment actions that um you know are, can be really suffused with with a lot of a lot of meaning, right? Can be connected to um you know matters of, of very deep purpose for us. Right. And so a, a fully agential action, um, in my view, is one that um, you know, moves us towards something that matters to us quite a lot. Um, and so that means a couple of things. That means to, to exercise real agency in your work, in your family, in your community. Um, you have to have things that, that, you know, you have to have purposes that mean something a lot, to, you know, mean a lot to you. Um, and you have to have the power to pursue those purposes in your day to day life. Um, and, you know, in ways that we can talk about, I think uh, both of those things, like having a sense of, of deep purpose and feeling like you have the power to pursue that purpose in your day-to-day -day life. I think both of those have really been curtailed in some, some difficult ways in contemporary America. And, you know, the results 
of that curtailment can manifest as anxiety, depression, political polarization, um, and uh, you know, as as we've been discussing more and more, uh, as loneliness. Hmm. I would love, in whatever detail you might like to share, to get your assessment. I mean, loneliness to me, it, you know, has probably been with human beings and a part of human yeah. nature for forever. But mm -hmm. you know, in terms of your understanding of the history of modern has the history of loneliness in maybe America specifically and yeah. it's it's commonality in modern life there does seem to be some evidence that the problem has gotten far worse and i i'd love in as much detail as you might like to provide to let you speak to that story in your in your mind whether that's from the beginning of the 20th century to now how do you think about the rise historically if you agree with that assessment of loneliness in modern times yeah i mean i i do think it is rising um you know we have you know there's a lot of talk about an epidemic a growing epidemic of loneliness um the uh you know the the long historical comparison is difficult um you know we want to say oh from the 50s or from the 70s till now people got much less lonely we just don't actually have very good data on that um, because over the course of those periods, there were just different definitions of loneliness that would be used in a particular study. Sometimes researchers would ask, um, you know, have you been lonely in the past week? Sometimes they would ask, have you been, are you always lonely all the time? Mm -hmm. And so we, we just really can't tell a, a compelling kind of long-term story. Um, we, we can tell a couple of other stories, kind of related stories with some significant confidence. So, uh, for instance, American trust in each other and in our institutions has been plummeting for, uh, I think, 50 years or so. You know, learning a little bit more about this and reading some yeah, of yeah. Robert, Robert Putnam's work, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he points to a lot of data of just, I think, in general, what he regards as a decline in social capital in the for country. Sure. And that there are all these data points that he brings up of that it seemed to indicate in his mind that people are less engaged communally than they used to be with religious participation, with joining yep. of clubs, uh, with even having people over to their homes, hosting people at their homes um, for, you know, a dinner or just to hang out as friends. Yep. And, you know, my takeaway from his book is that he mostly points to you know, the late 50s, early 60s as one of the high points of civic engagement. And the decline kind of begins there. I know for Robert, one of the funny things about reading his work is that the uh, sort of enemy number one to connectedness in his mind was television. That that book came mm -hmm. out, I think, in the 90s or maybe 2000, way before yeah. the iPhone came out. Um, so... I don't know if you want to take it from there, but that that's kind of my general assessment of Great. what what he has pointed to as some evidence for the the uh, disconnection. Totally, yes. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think the idea that our engagement with um, synagogues and churches and union halls um, and all that is is way down. I, I don't think anyone argues much with that. Um, I, I do think, you know. In America, like, you know, we're a pretty young country and, and our historical memory seems to be even even younger. Um, so we we often will set, you know, 1950 as a kind of like origin point right? you know, yeah. for good or ill. You're like, oh, you know, the default was the 50s and here we are now in a, in a different spot. I mean, Putnam's quite good in, in his subsequent work at, at showing that, uh, you know, there was actually kind of a low point early 20th century. It kind of comes up in the middle and then falls back down as television is developed, as cars become the way we get around, as we move out to the suburbs and kind of, you know, fortress ourselves in there. Um, and uh, what was I say? suburbs. Oh, and then as and then also um, you know, just the, the turnover of generations that as we turn from the greatest generation to the baby boomers, the boomers are just a less civic generation. Um, you know, I, I always try to be careful not to, uh, you know, lionize 
the sort of the the trunk glory you the the 30 years after the second world war um too much because you know in my view if you raise a generation of kids um you know in a particular cultural setting and almost all of them reject it <laughs> like yeah then then maybe you know that beautiful belonging wasn't quite what it was cracked up to be right like at the same time as you know everyone's sort of joining organizations and uh, you know being involved in their communities you have books coming out about how sort of plastic and artificial society is and all the conformity that's required to be part of it and and of course it was a you know it wasn't a period of of great belonging and embrace um mm -hmm. you know if if your identity wasn't sort of um, mainstream you know white christian um straight at that time um but uh dan what was your question just the the just, giving just giving some yeah putnam and the the data that seems to indicate if if you agree with the sentiment that people tend to be lonelier now than they used to be uh what that story is in broad yeah, yeah, strokes i know sorry, i know sorry. like to to your point um it, undoubtedly people of a certain race or sexual orientation probably felt extraordinarily isolated yeah. in earlier times in a way that they may not now um but i, I just wanted to set the table for the yeah, audience okay. to learn about where we've kind of come from and where we we are in general in terms of loneliness today right yeah, I mean, so I think that uh, a couple of changes that are are not up for debate um, is, you know, for one, that uh, religious participation is is at historic lows. It's way down, and uh, especially as as Gen Z has sort of aged into being counted now as adults, mm -hmm. um, it's it's lower than we've ever seen it in the states, um, and I think. You know, my my friend uh, and colleague Rick Weisbord has some research that came out uh, in, in last fall showing that young adults, 58 percent of young adults report lacking meaning and purpose in their lives. Um, and as I was saying before, I think, you know, meanings and purposes are typically what we bond around. Mm. Right. Like you you become friends with people because you love the same sports team or you enjoy the same hobby or the same music or you know, the same politics or whatever. Um, and if you don't have a strong sense of, of direction in your life, it, it's just going to be hard or maybe impossible to form like deep, strong, lifelong friendships and you know, people who are going to kind of be with you through thick and thin. Um, you know, traditionally religion was a main source where people kind of came to suss out, you know, the things that were of, of ultimate meaning in their lives. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to be in a church building for that to happen, but you need, you know, some forum to sort of reflect um, both by yourself and with others on, you know, what really matters to you in your life. Um, and I find, you know, I spend a lot of time in classrooms uh, with college students and I find that for quite a lot of them, and maybe the majority, there's just not been a moment, there's not been a setting where they have had an opportunity to really kind of lean back in their chairs and be like, all right, like, I know I'm hustling, hustling to get into a great college, you have a great career, you know, kind of check all the boxes. But like, what do I care about? Like, what do I really want to do with my time on earth? Does it mean anything? Who am I? Um, you know, we, we really don't have... Uh, you know, we don't have rites of passage very much in our society. Like, we just we just don't have these you know these these forums. And I think you know, as you alluded to, the rise of smartphones um, has made it much much worse, right? Because you know, you can get a certain kind of solitude. You can have a certain amount of reflection just if you have to walk down the block to the store, um, right? Or if you have you know twenty minutes free between appointments or something. Um, but if you have like a constant, extremely well-designed, intentionally addictive <laughs> source of sort of spectacle and entertainment in your pocket at all times, um, solitude is just going to become a lot, a lot more difficult, a lot, a lot scarcer. Um, so I think that, you know, that sort of eclipse of, of meaning for a lot of people, um, is a really important thing. It's a really, it's a strong driver of a kind of 
sense of being alone, a sense of lacking sort of strong community. Um, another one that I've just lately started to think a lot more about is, you know, the um, the sense a lot of us have that we don't exercise a great deal of power and decision making in our lives. Um, you know, I, I I've read a few times in the past few years uh, this, this little book by um, Frederick Taylor. Um, I'm trying to remember, it's something like science of management. He, he he's I think arguably the the founder of uh, management science. He, he's writing at the beginning of the 20th century, and and he intentionally explicitly is trying to design a way of doing business that removes all agency from the workers in the enterprise, right? That like, you know, if they have, they have knowledge that's been passed on to them about how to sort of work at their craft, um, you need to sort of extract all that knowledge from them and then concentrate it in the hands of a small group of managers who will then sort of um, script out their day, right? Like tell them moment to moment exactly what you need to be doing. Um, and I think, you know, Taylor would be just absolutely ecstatic to see how much control you can have, um, how much agency you can remove from your workers and concentrate in the hands of managers, you know, using digital technology, now using AI. Um, and so I think, you know, for quite a lot of working class people, you know, their day to day work life is not a place where they feel they have any power, they have any agency. And and those methods are are climbing up the ladder now. And they're they're starting to you know be present in white collar work as well, right? A lot of micromanagement, a lot of best practices, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of you know typing notes into computers. Um, and I think one one way you see that sort of impacting work is that there's a, a rise of, of burnout, even in a lot of high high you know high caliber white collar professions like medicine and law. Um, I have a friend who's in the ed school here and and at Harvard, and she says that burnout among teachers is massive. And it's not because they're tired. It's not because, you know, they have too much work. It's because they can't teach the way they want to. They feel totally micromanaged. And I think, you know, outside of our professional lives, a lot of us feel similarly. Um, you know, an example that I that I sometimes use is, you know, if your phone company decides to jack up your bill one month by seventy five dollars, um, and you want to look into that and find out why they did that, it would be very difficult for you to get in touch with a human being, mm -hmm. right? Like I have ended up on more than one occasion just cussing out the online chat bot out of spite um, and then giving up and being like, all right, I guess I pay an extra $75 this month. Um, so I, I think there's just a sort of, that these two things have sort of converged, a real a sense that we're not really in control of our own destiny, um, Right, because we just don't have the power to to decide and kind of craft a life and craft a community the way we want to. And then on the other side, that like, you know, increasingly we lack a sense of what we would even want to do, right? Like we we lack a sense of sort of deep uh the kind of deep purpose that can shape a life that can give sort of meaning to your your day-to-day -day activities. And so anyway, sorry, I I think those two things add up to this sort of crisis and and it has has a lot of um a lot of different aspects my my friend chris murphy is the senator from connecticut who's been talking a lot about this stuff um he calls it a spiritual crisis yeah and that may be you know maybe the best we can do because you know it 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 involves a sort of you know massive rise in levels of addiction um you know loneliness anxiety um you know kind of ugly tribalism um but but yeah in my understanding that you know that's this is, this is how we've gotten to the this point of crisis. And I'm glad you brought this up that you, you know, I, my understanding is that you're around college kids quite a bit. I, I think you teach yeah. co college students. And, um, you know, I think a lot of us have read the headlines about what the anxiety levels and addictiveness, addiction levels and probably loneliness levels yeah. are for, you know, young people in the, in our society and our culture. And I, I try as best I can when having these conversations to have people like you give, you know, students like that may listen to this advice on how to push back against some of these trends and uh, with the best, you know, information and judgment and wisdom you may be able to provide. And I'd be curious to know for the students that may not fall into that category of feeling purposeless, 
extremely lonely, um, kind of without uh, a sense of deep meaning in their life. What are the what are the people that are uh, not of that description doing? Or even if there aren't many that come to mind, what would you suggest as a you know, few pieces of advice for people to uh, you know push back against some of these prevailing trends in the culture? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a I have a, a, a beloved student and then TA of mine um, who says that if he has a if he's puzzled, if he has a big decision, if he doesn't know what to do, um, he'll get into his car. I mean, this is not so eco friendly, actually. So I'll talk to him, but but uh, he'll get into his car and put his phone kind of out of sight um, and just drive, just drive in silence until he figures it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I think self-enforced you know periods of solitude um can be extremely important um you know and solitude is is different from loneliness right i i i kind of say that you know solitude is sort of choosing to kind of take a walk outside of the house for a while and loneliness at least that kind of deep persistent loneliness is like being homeless like lacking a house altogether um but so I, i think for humans the kind of finding and refining and maintaining a sense of meaning and self in the world um it it involves this kind of dialectic between kind of going off by yourself kind of putting off like the responsibilities you know t- taking off this sort of like a custom sense of what i must do and who i am and, and and just kind of taking a breath um but then always you know eventually going back inside i think and finding people that you can open your mind to and and share, you know, what you're thinking and what you're feeling. Um, and I, so I think like I would I would recommend, you know, a two part cure. <laughs> uh, one is is find ways to build in solitude and reflection into your life. And the other is, um, you know, just try to try to speak with great candor and honesty to the people who who care about you um, and, you know, then spend the rest of your life kind of going back and forth between those two things. Cause I think that's how, how you maintain a really strong sense of, of who you are and what you want to do. And, you know, that's how you kind of cement uh, your relationships with uh, the people around you. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, it, it, the loneliest periods of my life were, were in college and uh, I, in many ways, I kind of look back at my former self back then as a different, kind of person. I mean, I remember my junior and senior years, particularly feeling like I basically didn't have anyone that I could confide in who was my Mm -hmm. age. I mean, when you're a teenager or in your early twenties, it's already in an awkward time. And I, I, you know, I went to Duke and it was filled with overachieving status oriented young people like myself. And I, 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 the vulnerability required to be able to tell anyone that age that you're not doing well, particularly in a very competitive environment is, is often tough to find. Um, yeah, for sure. but, but to your point, I think the, having the space to get real with yourself is very helpful in reorienting. If that is indeed the the situation for somebody that's, um, you know, just in a life that doesn't really feel right to them or doesn't make sense to them, or they lack anyone around them who's their age that they feel like they can be honest with about their struggles. It reminds me, I wanted to read this quote out to you because this is a Carl Jung line that I kept thinking about when I was reading uh, in preparation for this conversation. And the, the line is, quote, loneliness does not come from having no people about one, but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that general sentiment, but I, I certainly have, have uh, lived through times like that. Yeah, no, so I, I think, um, you know, I think that sort of going out to the wilderness by yourself is incredibly important, as I said, but I think human cognition is such that, um, you know, you, whatever it is you see out there in the wilderness, like whatever it is you sort of understand about yourself and <laughs> what matters to you, uh, you're going to you're going to need to share that with other people if you're going to preserve it right like these things tend to evaporate we can't really hold ourselves to them 
um, if we're trying to do it in, in total isolation. Um, so there's this uh, interesting literature around uh, the practice of solitary confinement. Um, solitary confinement was initially promoted in the U.S. by Quakers, um, who, you know, on a very good philanthropic motivations, thought that, you know, okay, so humans are fundamentally kind of the solitary animal. And, um, you know, if if Dan, if his kind of machine starts malfunctioning, we, we kind of put him by himself for a while, let him get his feedback under him, and then we'll bring him back into community, um, kind of healed. So it, it turned out that, you know, for people who, um, you know, have run afoul of the kind of social compact, to take them and put them by themselves um, against their will um, is just absolutely devastating. Um, you know, the the kind of the, the baseline stuff that everyone experiences in, in that kind of scenario, um, you know, one is that you, uh, you lose the ability to focus your attention. Your mind becomes kind of a, a wash, you know, it's kind of going every which way. And you can't decide what you want to think about and focus on. And the other is that you, you lose the ability to self-regulate. Um, so you can't kind of hold yourself steady. You can't sort of regulate your emotions or your body. Um, the whole thing kind of starts to spin out of control. And that's the baseline. That's the mild stuff. Um, there's all sorts of uh, literature about what happens under more extreme cases um, where prisoners go through a process that's called derealization, where they lose the ability to sort of maintain a firm sense of what is true and what is not, what is real and what is fake. They start to hallucinate. They start to hear voices. They start to... Um, you know, they'll see like the bars on their cells start to wiggle. Um, they will become absolutely uncontrollably fixated on fantasies of revenge against the guards. Um, so, you know, us maintaining a sense of like, who am I? What matters in this world? What kind of man should I be? What should I do in this situation? That seems not to be stuff that we can really maintain alone. Like we seem to to need to be in these kind of fortifying feedback loops with other minds in order to keep those sort of judgments kind of steady in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was about a year ago that I had uh, one of the co-authors of the, I think it was called the Harvard study of human development, something like that, that mm -hmm. followed these dozens of people throughout their lives from, I think, starting in the thirties or forties to try to create an analysis as best they could about what, led to a flourishing life and it wouldn't yeah. surprise me if you're familiar with that that work yeah. but the big takeaway was that the number one component to a thriving life is good relationships and uh, superior to all of the other creature comforts and possibilities yeah. that might fill that uh section that that was what came in in number one in the in the number one place and um I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or have read that or, you know, talk to your students about that, that prioritizing that seems to, well, I mean, one of the crazy things about that study was that they seem to be indicating that your immune system is predictably working better when you have close relationships. You literally physically heal faster yes, you when do. you feel supported by, you know, a warm and supportive community. So I just want to put that to you and get any additional feedback you may have on that study and any thoughts you have on it. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we tend in the, in the States to, um, you know, we know all this stuff scientifically, but in practice in our institutions and in our customs and our kind of like public ideals, we tend to think of each person as a kind of freestanding autonomous self-created agent. Um, and that is, just like empirically not accurate um and you know trying to run a life or a society or just an institution around that picture of humanity i think is just going to tend to be corrosive it's going to tend to hurt people um you know at a certain point in our uh evolution we learned to cook meat um and uh you know, as a result of eating all this soft cooked meat, um, our teeth got less sharp, they got weaker, they got smaller. Um, and so, you know, over the course of eating all this delicious cooked meat, um, our bodies evolved to a point where we can't eat raw meat anymore. We're mm -hmm. like not set up for it. Um, and I think, you know, 
human cognition and human ways of, of, of being in the world and making sense of your life, um, they, they've developed in a direction sort of guided by our social sociality, right? Like we are kind of herd animals. We, we survive, we, we've survived and thrived because of our ability to cooperate together. But in the process, we've, we've become utterly dependent on that too. Right. Mm. To the point where, like, if you try to pull out of that now and, and make yourself a, a total hermit, um, nine times out of 10, you're, you're going to go insane. Like mm. human, the human sort of cognitive apparatus just is no longer fit for that. Um, with, with some, you know, very few exceptions of, of actual hermits and, and monks. But but in those cases, um, you know, I, I think even in those cases, uh, you know, what you have are people who you know, are going out into the desert or whatever to, to live in solitude. But they, you know, they, they typically feel that they're going there to kind of go into deeper communion with God or, you know, with, with the cosmos or something. Um, and in a lot of cases, there is still, even then, this sort of, um, this dialectic of going out and then coming back into the village and going out. Um, so yes, anyway, in short, I, I think that uh, the, we... At this point in our sort of species history, like we just are set up for um, close communion with other human beings and and kind of just can't do without it. Yeah, it, it's funny thinking about the way in which I, I think similarly kind of about the way this the standard American diet is set up that if you couldn't pick in many circumstances a less healthy offering for human beings and for human flourishing than what for example, many of us mm -hmm. were fed as children. And, right. you know, when I think about the changes to the culture in general, and in some ways in the last 50 or 60 or 70 years, they seem to be directly in uh, conflict with the idea that you should prioritize close relationships and friendships. Um, yes. You know, the, the tendency for workaholism and for right. all the addictions that you talked about earlier with modern technology. And, totally. you know, if, if it really is true that being around, and I, to me, this is some of what you're getting at is that a lot of the appetites that are being advertised uh, towards people are insatiable, that that advertising is uh, kind of coming at a lot of people with the idea that you you're at a deficit until you own something new that yeah. might make you your happiness significantly better. And I, I think there's a ton of evidence to think that there's no reason to believe that, that uh, wisdom would be better applied towards prioritizing other things in life. And again, like I, I know you, inter you interact with a lot of college students now, like, do you give them certain advice? Because they're about to begin their adult careers after they leave your, your community and classroom of what they may want to think about prioritizing as they go out into the world, because the world to Harvard students, they're going to be offering them 70 or 80 hour a week positions oh, yeah. indefinitely. So I'd love to put that to you and get any thoughts you have on prioritizing a, you know, a wise life. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so my students, uh, I mean, a, a couple of things. One is, you know, contrary to a lot of the public image of you know, 21st century college students, um, I don't find them and haven't found them over 15 years of classroom teaching to be sort of, you know, radical activists for the most part. Like most of them are pretty damn scared mm. and are are doing what they think they need to do to be safe, to be okay in the world. So I've had, you know, many, many times where I faced down a, a room full of finance majors <laughs> And I was like, well, why, why, are you, why are you studying finance? And they're all like, it just seems like a secure way to, to have enough. I, I could maybe get some savings and, and then I wouldn't have to worry so much. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, I'll, and these are, you know, they haven't always been Harvard students, but they've always been elite New England undergrads. Um, and, you know, those people are set up as well as we as someone can be set up to be safe and successful in, in, in modern America. Um, but they have sort of internalized this ambient kind of atmosphere of, of competition and of every man for himself. And so they're working desperately 
not to lose out, right? They're not necessarily working to build something beautiful or to pursue the things they want, they deeply want. They're just working to to kind of survive, right? And mm-hmm. and, and you know, they're they're terrified. There's a certain period in the in the winter when people start to get their uh in summer internship assignments. And man, like if you've ever talked to a student who doesn't have an internship for the summer when everyone else does, like there is just animal panic in their eyes, <laughs> right? Like they just they just feel absolutely that they're going to be left behind. There'll be nothing for them. You know, they they just I think lay, a lot of them labor under a kind of sense of just general scarcity and competition. Um, and I think that, you know, aids in a in a way of of thinking about your life and your career and your work um, that is extremely good for the people who, who mm. you know, hold hold the reins of power and who have a lot of money, say, because um, if you can induce your employees to think that, like, you know, this job and this career is all that stands between them and, and destitution and social death, like you're going to have a nice docile employee, right? You're going to have someone yeah. who's very willing to stay late, right? And uh, let's say if in a, in a very wealthy country like ours, you know, their ability to, you know, to see a doctor and to get medication was also dependent on them keeping this job, then like, you know, all the better, right? Like they really have no choice but to do what you tell them to do. Um, and, you know, so you get a lot of kids who like are, you know, as you say, very status obsessed, very career focused, not out of like any great sense of adventure or pleasure, but like, just cause they're scared and they feel like you need to do this. But, you know, they they tend to, and, and I don't think this is just a kind of contemporary American problem. I think this is a human problem. But, you know, a lot of them will tend to think, all right, if I can just, you know, get that good first job, then I can take a breath, right? Yeah. Then I can start to live a little bit. And they'll get the good first. And this is what I, I, I tell them explicitly, like, you're going to get the good first job. And then you're going to think, okay, all right, all right, all right. If I can get that first promotion, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to take a breath. They're like, okay, well, I got the promotion, but... If I can get into a good law school, then I'm going to be okay, right? And then like, okay, if I can get a good job at a firm, I'll be okay. Then if I can make partner at the firm, I'll be okay and I'll start to live, right? And, you know, it's really it's really good for the for your bosses um, to have you sort of always placing, you know, your real life just past the next milestone. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a, it's a desperate way to live, right? Like, you know, at, at a certain point, you're going to have to figure out how to make peace with with the fact that you're dying <laughs> and the fact that like you know you're only this and that your life is exactly this and and nothing else and and that the world is just like this as it is and um you know i think that this way of sort of indexing happiness to you know whatever the next level of achievement or acquisition is kind of on the horizon um it's pervasive and and super toxic. And and so, you know, whenever and however I'm able, I try to kind of at least point out this structure to my students, you know, point out that like, you, you know, you, you probably feel like your life's really going to begin at the next stage. Right. (laughs) And and most of them, most of them uh, agree. Uh, So yeah, that's, that's at least part of what I, what I try to do as a teacher. Yeah. And, and the alternative to that, right. That they, there's an understandable desire. I mean, barring revolution, we're going to be living in a capitalist society for quite a long time in this country. And uh, I have a lot of empathy for people that, you know, want to take care of their own financial circumstances to for sure, yeah. lower their stress levels as soon as possible in that regard. And so given that reality and given that life is about trade-offs more or less, um, there are very few perfect solutions to anything in this world. Mm-hmm. What are some alternative paths that you know you think might be appropriate for you know talented, hardworking young people that you know are both interested in having a life of meaning and uh, you know not don't want to live paycheck to paycheck for their entire life? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, there are professions or career paths that are not soul killing. Right. And I, you know, I could say that I feel that way about the stuff I've been privileged to do um, that I've, I've felt, you know, fed and nourished by the work that I do 
you know, for much of my life, and it's it's not been easy. I, I mean, I was an adjunct for like ten years, um, you know, barely barely scraping by, and, and poverty is incredibly stressful and difficult. It's I kind of shudder to remember, you know, mm-hmm. all those those years of being just on the edge. Um, but but yeah, there are there are things you could do that you you would love, right? It would have a lot of meaning for you, and and I think that'll vary a bit person by person, um, which is why, you know, you need to have time in your life to reflect and you need to be able to step away from the herd a little bit and, and think about what, what matters. Um, I, I do think, you know, I will, I will grant hypothetically that grinding for 90 hours a week as a Goldman Sachs analyst could be meaningful to someone, um, hypothetically. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, for most people, that is going to be soul crushing. And, and in fact, most of my students who are planning to go on to Goldman are very wide eyed about that. They're like, it's going to be soul crushing. Like, <laughs> I'm going to hate my life. You know, I'll work 90 hours a week. I won't have a social life, but I'll stack up, stack up some money. Right. And they always say, well, and then a little while after that, you know, once I get some money, then I'll step away and do something I care about. Um, but I, 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 I you know, whether they're going to do that is another question. I think most of them, or at least many of them won't because, you know, they'll get accustomed to a certain lifestyle and, you know, they'll, they'll stay on that track. Um, but I, I think that uh, the the ways that we've arranged a lot of our work is just not susceptible to being meaningful. Um, right. Like it, I, I just don't understand how like grinding 90 hours a week at spreadsheets and PowerPoints to make a little more profit for you know the shareholders of Goldman Sachs can be something that that fires your soul and mm-hmm. you know makes you sort of um, want to build a life around this um, and and I, I I think it doesn't look like a lot of the ways we do things are in some sense efficient and they're and they're certainly very productive right like the kind of economy that we have humming in the U.S. right now. Um, is pretty pretty extraordinary on in historical terms. Um, so it you know it, it it's excellent for some things, and I think pretty bad for human flourishing. Um, and I don't think that it's necessary that we keep running our businesses or our economy like this. I think we would have to you know come to peace with the fact that you know maximal growth year over year is not the goal of human life. Um, but, you know, as we can do that, I think, um, you know, I think we could build ways of working and ways of having an economy and exchanging goods that that wouldn't be so, so soul crushing for people. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot about, you know, worker ownership. I think, you know, if you and I, Dan, you know, own a business together that we're building, then we might really feel like comrades, right? Like we're, we're good friends. We're, you know, you're my brother. We're building something together. This is this means a lot to me. Um, and so I think, you know, creating more structures where workers feel a sense of ownership over what they're doing could be super important. I think, you know, the revi- revitalization of unions that we're starting to see is really important because, you know, unions, you know, obviously in the first instance, they give workers the opportunity to, you know, bargain on on relatively even ground with their employer. Um, so maybe they can make enough money to, you know, to live comfortably. Um, but they also, you know, they've typ- typically been a site of of real sort of solidarity and friendship, right? Like the union hall used to be a place where you would go to like see people you, you really cared about and who had your back and who shared a picture of the world with you. Um, so I think, you know, there are stirrings we start to we're starting to see um in directions like those where people are 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 just getting absolutely exhausted with the kind of you know career life working life that you know that is dominant at least in you know, places like duke and, and harvard yeah yeah i mean uh, to to that point about co-ownership i cut my teeth you know my professional career for uh, almost 10 years was in the startup world in san francisco and right. yep. it's very customary in that space for you know employees that are going to work pretty hard to get a cut of mm-hmm. um you know the success of the business if you get a little lucky and you work hard and you have a talented team and i've always right. preferred that model personally to 
you know, a decade or more of 90 hours a week working for some much larger entity. And I think yeah. that's a big reason why a lot of probably your students end up going west or joining teams yeah. like that to try to um, solve the money problem as quickly as they can. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to read out something from your essay, which is called What's Behind America's Loneliness Crisis. And um, read this, read it out and get your thoughts on a couple things. And this right. is the the quote. The quote is, quote, Hannah Ar Arendt famously argued that loneliness is the sine qua non precondition of totalitarianism. The lack of shared agency is a desperate condition for our kind of animal. The lonely will scramble for community, even if it requires believing or doing terrible things. If the American experiment is going to survive the current century without turning into something awful, we will need the, we will need the vision and courage to radically reimagine the purpose of our collective life and to allow the wide distribution of meaningful tasks. I've had a bunch of interviews in the last month or two about men and the plight and struggles of modern men in many areas. I had Richard Reeves on my show uh, about a year yeah. ago who wrote of boys and men, which sort of put the yeah. data to the decline of, of men in general in modern life. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up to you because we're talking on the 16th of July, a few days after an assassination attempt on yeah. a former president. And, I should caveat this by noting, I don't think we know, to my knowledge, a whole lot about the motive uh, for this young man to have attempted what he did. And separate from anyone's political belief, this is not a new phenomenon in American life where seemingly an isolated, lonely, yep. you know, bullied young person, young man right. acts out like this. Obviously, this is the gross exception to the rule, but it is a recurring phenomenon that I think anyone who yeah. lives in this country has seen. And so, you know, given the timeliness of this conversation and how I would not be surprised whatsoever if a lot of what may have motivated this young man to do what he did stemmed from extreme isolation, extreme loneliness, and yeah. uh, a desire to, you know, inflict violence upon someone else and and the culture in general what you've made of what just happened in our country and um just the phenomenon of of you know men specifically right now who uh have a a story that may be very similar to this uh attempted assassin the other day yeah um yeah i mean i think that's right i think that you know what, what Hannah Arendt is talking about in the wake of the Second World War and the Holocaust, this uh, this dynamic of of the lonely being so desperate, you know, for some sense of of connection, meaning, belonging, that like they'll do terrible things to kind of make themselves someone. Um, I think it is something that we see again and again, and um, you know, it's it's just especially acute in America. I've not heard of any other country where they have, uh, you know, an equivalent, uh, you know, instance or equ equivalent quantity of these these sort of um, these sort of events. Um, you know, the question of of gender is an interesting one, and obviously, braided and you know, <laughs> a little dangerous to wade into. Maybe um, I was just talking with a a colleague here. Uh, last week about loneliness and agency and, and how it seems to show up differently between boys and girls and women and men. Um, you know, and, you know, and, you know, quite apart from, uh, you know, from sort of young men, young, lonely, uh, ostracized men lashing out in that, that violent sort of way. Um, you know, the, the phenomena that Richard Reeves documents in that book um, or I think are much more pervasive that, uh, you know, under whatever these conditions of modern life are, however we want to articulate them, young men um, are, you know, dropping out of the workforce, dropping out of education, just sort of falling into a kind of um, vortex of porn, video games, and internet chat rooms. Um, 
you know, in a way that young women are not right now. Um, And, you know, whatever the system is that we have, um, women and girls seem to be doing a lot better in it than boys and men are. Um, You know, I was on a panel with Richard shortly after that book came out. And, um, you know, I, I talked about my experience with my students. I, I said, you know, there some semesters, uh, there comes a point, maybe every semester, where at least some of the students decide you're full of shit. And like, <laughs> this course is not interesting or useful to them. And, and you know, they have more important things to think about. Um, and, you know, that happens whenever that can happen across gender. But what I said was, you know, when that happens to young men, they they tend to disappear. They kind of stop showing up to class. They're They're totally disengaged. When that happens to young women, you you've lost them emotionally, and you can kind of tell. Um, but they'll they'll still show up to class. They'll still take notes, right? Um, and both of the, you know, in either case, they don't like this. They don't think it's good. They don't think it's valuable. But the women are more willing to just keep plugging at it. In my experience, and so I think you know, if men are faring differently than women right now, I don't think it's because women are thriving. Mm. Like I think for a lot, a lot of Americans right now, there's a sense that the systems that we live and work in, the tasks that we spend our days on are not that meaningful, are not that good, are not designed for our benefit, certainly. Um, And I think for whatever set of reasons, men are more likely to explode and to rebel, whether that's by dropping out or lashing out um, than women are. But I think that, you know, the underlying problems of those kind of lack of meaning, a lack of sense of, of solidarity are, uh, you know, just pervasive right now. Yeah. I remember Richard saying this when, when I talked to him that it was, you know, in his judgment, it was much more common. I think you just said this for men to, you know, fade away than act out that they were far yeah. more common to, and, and this is something I've repeated on this show before that a, a big reason why so many men who overdose die is because there's no one there when mm. they when they overdose and no one is yeah. there to to save them and to call 911 in a timely manner where their yeah. their life could be saved. You right. know, I I heard um Scott Galloway give this assessment and it, you know this is more generally about a point that I've tried to bring up on the show a few times about you know, the risk to the country now is largely an internal risk it's it's not an external obviously there are external threats to america but it's the capacity for us to really dissolve internally that could bring down um, the country in some very serious ways and i i heard uh, an interesting idea from scott galloway the other day that it was it was his big fear for these isolated men which you just described which are spending so much of their time you know addicted to porn alone uh, playing video games, not really interacting socially that with the advent of, you know, potentially forthcoming AI girlfriends, Mm -hmm. that if those systems were hacked and very slowly moving Mm -hmm. men towards further radicalization and persuade, you know, if, if somehow a foreign agent, foreign government were able to, um, create that that's sort of an intrusion on the technology where men could be influenced in that way that to him that was one of the great risks to the country and for internal violence and um you know a lack of cohesion that that he saw yeah. i don't know if you thought about that in general but i'd love to put that to you well i mean yeah ai is is interesting um you know everyone's very excited about ai right now um we're speaking on july 16th of 2024 this will be a historical artifact at some point right now (laughs) everyone's very excited about ai um i think it's overblown um i don't think it's going to change our lives all that much i think it'll change like the first 10 years of a white collar career for instance um i think a lot of those kind of analyst tax tasks will be uh you know doable by ai um you know but i i think that the furor about it it has a couple of different um angles i think some people are really excited about it because it's you know ai is finally going to save us from all this like all this damn agency and responsibility and you know the need to make judgments and and make things work um you know we'll finally be able to just hand it off (laughs) 
um, then I think other people are are terrified because the robots are finally going to take over and take you know assume these roles of of judgment and and leadership and, and all that. So I think it really is like I think it's interesting. It's important, but. I think the furor over it is a sort of proxy for a lot of these sort of feelings that we have about about our own ability to kind of run our lives, run our run our society together. Um, so you know that's that's the AI part of it. Um, there was a, a a piece that I I found interesting was out maybe a couple of weeks ago by the historian Neil Ferguson. Yeah, I, did you see it? I think it's called "We're All Soviets Now." I read that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that apart from whatever kind of scenario about AI kind of hacking our brains, which, you know, maybe it can happen. Um, I think just in general, a society where, you know, people have basically given up on the kind of guiding ideals and don't feel like they're part of something that is real and moving and effective um, and are just kind of paying lip service to, you know, whatever they're quote unquote supposed to say is supposed to think um, is a, a weak one, just full stop. Like it's one that is not going to be able to respond ably to all sorts of challenges, right? Whether they're internal or external. Um, I think honestly, you know, I, I don't disagree with Ferguson's argument that, you know, if I'm China or if I'm Russia or if I'm some other, you know, geopolitical rival and I'm looking over at the United States of America, I'm kind of like licking my lips. I'm like, okay, like this is they're 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 good for the getting pretty soon. Like, you know, this they're they're not gonna maintain a position of real strength and dominance much longer. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think our own, you know, we desperately it's it's hard to put it strongly enough that we desperately need to get our house in order um because you know if we don't if we continue down the path we're going and the our two you know our two political parties are behaving as they have our you know leaders of business and, and the economy are running things the way they do i just don't I, I really literally think it's not sustainable um so it's some sort of catastrophe awaits right mm -hmm. um you know and you know, we can the people in my part of the world are just apoplectic about Donald Trump and, you know, the rise of various kind of subcultures on the Internet and Andrew Tate and all this stuff, a lot of which is really, truly noxious mm. and inhumane. But I'm always like, OK, well, then you tell a better story. <laughs> Don't like kick your feet and whine about how young men are being tricked by the bots like can step up and like give young men something to care about and tell them a story of like how to be a good human being and, and what it, what it means to, to build a life that's worth something. Um, and, you know, we've really stepped away from that in our public life in the United States for at least a few decades. Um, and I, I think it's just, it, it's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, I know I've heard you say in another interview that, uh, you know, you are not opposed to telling your students what to do. Um, there's a quote, I've I always, say that? <laughs> something, something like that, that they and that they were very amenable to that sort of commentary from you that they, you know, these are kids oftentimes that are looking for advice on what what to do with their life. And a, a line I've always loved, which is, is that high status Americans walk like the 50s and talk like the 60s that there's a disconnect mm -hmm. oftentimes between what people oh, say and what they do. And that, um, you know, there's more of a, a hunger to your point. I mean, I, Richard Reeves said this to me when, when he was on the show a year ago, that, uh, it, it was really the lack of a script for men that in his yeah. judgment led to people like the rise of Andrew Tate right. and that a lot of guys are just adrift and that someone like a Jordan Peterson became for all of his, eccentricities a digital father figure for so many oh, men sure. who were who were desperate for you know advice and an older man telling them how to live a better more yeah. meaningful existence yeah yeah i mean like i don't know if, <laughs> i haven't spent a ton of time in the like tate, tate sphere or whatever but um if you there are some interviews with andrew tate where he talks about his dad who was absent from his life and 
he's a wounded kid, Andrew mm. Tate is. Mm. Like he really lacks that sense of a, a strong father. And he you can hear it in his voice that he's still mourning about it. Or you're not mourning, because that would be healthy, but um, but he's you know, he's trying to construct kind of as best he can from the internet and whatever bullshit, like <laughs> a, a picture of a good life. And I mean, I think Peterson is Peterson's like breaking down and sobbing pretty regularly, like on his podcast. Like, yeah. like these are broken people too. These are people who feel like they lack a father. Um, and yeah, they're, they're trying to build, they're trying to save their own souls. And then, you know, there's a bunch of young guys who are, uh, you know, just kind of desperate for someone who's going to save theirs. Yeah. I know we're getting towards the end of our time together and I wanted to maybe close with uh, a final question. And before I do, I just wanted to read out a couple of other uh, or a few other quotes that I came across that I thought were uh, relevant to this discussion today. And a, a couple of them, I think both of them are from uh, Robert Putnam. And this is from Bowling Alone, quote, social dislocation can easily breed a reactionary form of nostalgia. This is another yeah, one, quote, sure. busy people tend to forego the one activity, TV watching, that is most lethal to community involvement. I think you could substitute that with mm -hmm. probably smartphone addiction today. And then a, fi a final um, one, or maybe two more, quote, community connectedness is not just about warm, fuzzy tales of civic triumph. In measurable and well-documented ways, social capital makes an enormous difference in our lives. Social capital makes us smarter, healthier, safer, richer, and better able to govern a just and stable democracy. And then the last one is, quote, most Americans watch friends rather than having friends. You know, his quote on social capital, just for me, I want to note an anecdote and then ask you a final question is, you know, I've noticed this in in myself just over time, uh, the it, growing desire for me personally to have within walking distance, a high number of friends that right. I can go and hang out with. And that, that really does transform your life in a way that very few things do. And it's a big reason why I moved from Austin, Texas to Williamsburg, Brooklyn earlier this year. And it's, it, it's more expensive. It's more of a pain in the ass in many ways, but I think in many ways it makes for a much richer life. And this dovetails into my last question to you, which is, are there communities or cultures in the world that, you know, you point to and regarding loneliness specifically think, you know, they're really doing it right. They have something that we've largely lost in our culture. I know the Amish are often pointed to as having for all of their eccentricities, uh, a very low rate of depression and loneliness, as I understand it. And I don't know if there are certain states or cities or lifestyles or even outside of the country, certain places that you have read about, have studied that you yeah. think are are really, you said this earlier about how, you know, this is really a need, like food is a need for people. It's like yeah. a vitamin that it, if people don't have it, it, there's a gaping hole in their life. Um, yeah. I'd love to close with that, with any, you know, models that modern people, your students, other, other people who may come across this interview may want to look to for inspiration, for knowledge about how to, you know, fight back against some of these trends. Yeah. I mean, so look, this, the state of Utah is doing quite well in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, uh, the shared Mormon faith of a lot of the residents does lead to a lot of social capital. I hate that phrase and I regret mm. using it just now, but um, but it does uh, it does produce, you know, a lot of these good benefits of community and belonging that we talk about. Um, and Utah is in the lead on a lot of, you know, pretty impressive categories that you know, try to sort of approximate uh, the well-being of the community. Um, so that's one. Um, I've spent a little bit of time with it a community called the Bruderhof. Um, hmm. So I write, I write sometimes for a good little quarterly magazine called Plow that's put out by this, um, this Christian community called the Bruderhof. And they, there was originally a, a German, I believe a German youth movement, like one of the, the von der Vogel, these sort of groups of, of young people who would go hiking in the wilderness and build these communities uh, kind of beef leading up to the first world war. Um, 
And some of them went like Nazi youth, but Bruderhof was pacifist and Christian. Um, anyway, they, they survive and they have some communities here in the United States and, um, you know, they, they hold these writers retreats so that my, my family and I have been able to, to go up there a few times and spend, you know, a number of days. And anyway, um, this is a group, there's one um, in upstate New York in the Hudson River Valley uh, that we've spent time at. And I think there's maybe two or 300 people there. Um, they have a, a toy factory on site that they, a, a number of them work at. They have a publishing house um, they, that they, you know, they work together at. And uh, the community is entire, entirely self-sustaining. They grow a lot of their food. And um, you have zero private property. Like, you know, the, the kind of host mother we were staying with, Maureen, was like, yeah, I don't own the clothes I'm wearing right now. <laughs> And uh, she's like, no, no one's going to come and demand them from me. But like, I own nothing in the world, right? Everything that I own is, is, or any, you know, anything I have is communal property of, of our, of our community, um, which, you know, to modern ear sounds terrifying. Um, but she also said, look, you know, I, I've got a brother with really significant special needs who has needed extremely specialized health care through his whole life. And I've never even seen a bill like it's all been paid for out of the communal treasury. And, um, you know, I've tried to like thank them or apologize before. And they're like, get out of here. Like, mm. you don't thank us for this. Like, this is what we do. We take care of each other. And and so anyone in that community knows that they will live out all their days sufficiently provided for. Um, right? The community will, will take care of them. And I think, you know, that's extreme, right? And that's extreme for, um for, for modern people to be certain, but in the long historical scope, it's not extreme. Um, it actually is much closer to the human default of how people would live, where your security comes not from like your insurance policy or your, your savings, but it comes from the fact that I'm in relationship with these other 150 people. And if my crops fail this year, someone's won't. And mm -hmm. like, we'll, we'll have enough because we'll pool our resources. Um, and I think you know, I, I, I probably am not going to join the Bruderhof and um, I wouldn't expect many of your listeners will either, but I do think we could all really benefit from, uh, you know, finding ways to move more in that direction where we're taking care of one another and, you know, your well-being and your personal and physical and economic survival is not just your responsibility, mm -hmm. right? but that it's sort of pooled and shared. Um, yeah, I mean, we could end there or, uh, you know, I, I've also, I've spent some time recently in Uganda, um, and in rural Uganda and, it, oh, actually, sorry. So, you know, one of the things that I have learned from my friends in the border hop is that actually smartphones are making incursions, even among the Amish now, mm. um, that that it's not at all uncommon for young people to smuggle smartphones in um and then the whole raft of stuff that comes along comes along right so porn finding ways to get their hands on drugs i heard a similar thing in rural uganda recently from some friends there that they feel like their community is being torn apart by the arrival of smartphones that the young people don't want to do this sort of communal gatherings anymore. They don't want to sit by the fire and roast an animal and eat it together. They want to look at TikToks of fast cars and women in bikinis. Mm. Um, and so they're like in high alarm right now that like their community is falling apart. Um, I think it may be that some of these technologies are so well designed to make us addicted to just capitalize on every kind of weakness we have that they might be we may look back on this period and be like we we did what to ourselves now like <laughs> we let what kinds of companies and what kind of devices kind of um you know invade our our common life um i don't know i don't know maybe we'll just get used to it but uh but yeah i think you know finding ways to firewall and to push back against uh some of these corrosive aspects of modern life is you know it's, it's absolutely something we need to to get better at yeah yeah i think i think that's a good place to stop and i think also it's you know there's a selfishness to your own life to having that kind of discipline i mean the goal is to have a better 
more connected, more thriving life. And if that's the near term pain to give up like any addiction, uh, yeah. that's required to, to make that adjustment. It seems like that would be a prudent thing to do. Did you see the thing about the Amazon un uncontacted, uncontacted Amazon tribe recently? I didn't see that. No. So someone got a couple of uncontacted Amazon tribes, Starlink like a month ago. No, the, the story came out like a month ago. Um, and got them all smartphones and they're fucking ruined. <laughs> like they're spending like seven hours a day on their phones only because the Starlink is turned off for the rest of the, for the, the, the other part of the day. Right. Yeah. And then all day Saturday. So there are these harrowing pictures that I think there were in the New York times of like a camp of like uncontacted Amazon people all just staring at us, each of their their own smartphones. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's it's crazy. It's tragic. Um, anyway, yeah, fascinating. I mean, I I've always yeah, thought yeah. it like akin to cigarette smoking. You you exactly. it kind of has to get worse before it gets better. Where the mm -hmm. most people understand the damage, provided it's you know not it, we can actually break the addiction. And I think you're right that these things are designed explicitly to hijack us where we're where we're most vulnerable but i yeah I, my hope is that that pendulum swinging uh may need to come but it, it may need to get a lot worse before that happens absolutely yeah i agree yeah ian thank you so much for your time and the work that you do on the subject i think it's really important and it's great to meet you man all right thanks a lot dan i appreciate it